Holy is the Lord. Appreciate what Caitlin said. And when we begin to worship, say things like holy, we only join what's already going on in heaven. We're just joining them. Amen. He's the center of attention. Lamb of God, take it away the sin of the world. Amen. Thank you, musicians. I don't think I'll sing tonight. I've been wanting for some time to talk to us on Sunday evening about the Holy Spirit and His role in our lives. And I just began to look into God's Word this week, and I couldn't get past this one little verse in such a unique setting, talking about the Holy Spirit. In fact, I, I want to give just a little preface before we even read it. It really, when it comes down to it, it's about the Holy Spirit at a business meeting. Or maybe you could say at a theological discussion. I'm talking about in the Bible. I don't know if anyone knows where I'm headed yet. But I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. If you have one of those Bibles that gives you topic, it might say here, this is the council at Jerusalem. Amen. And I'm going to tell a little bit of the story in the message tonight. So right now, I just want to read one verse. And so if you'd stand, we'll read this verse and we'll pray. Amen. Now, it's, a, it's an hour later on your bodies, and I'm going to be real kind to you. you know, it's, it, <laughs> Amen. Somebody sent me something this morning and said there's not much difference between a long sermon. There's a, there's a narrow line between a long sermon and a captive hostage situation. Acts 15, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no other or no greater burden than these necessary things. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. How'd they know that? How'd they know that? I want to preach tonight or teach whatever tonight just a little bit on the Holy Spirit involved. Holy Spirit involved. You know, if we were honest tonight, that's what we desperately need in our lives as believers on, on every level. We need the Holy Spirit involved. Sometimes I pray, Holy Spirit, I want you involved in the way I think. I want you involved in the way I feel. I want you involved in the way I choose. Amen. If that's your desire tonight, would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may the Holy Spirit of whom we speak anoint me tonight to share this and anoint our hearts to receive. May this be an eternal moment. May we sense your presence here in a special way. Lord, we're unashamed to confess and admit that we need you. And we thank you, Lord, in advance for your help. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. You can be seated. I try to get things as accurately as possible and it was many years ago when my father shared this with me. But at my home church, and this was before my time of being able to remember, but at my church, for some home church, for some reason or the other, the home church when I was a child, for some reason or the other, they would have business meetings on Sunday night before church. Business meeting. Now, we don't have a lot of those church business meetings, but some of you had an experiences where a church business meeting can, let's just put it this way, can get intense. Okay? And my dad said they would have these church business meetings on Sunday night before church, and things would get a little intense, and people at one another a little bit. But he said the strangest thing was, he said, back in those days we were so hungry for God to move that we would close the business meeting and we begin church on Sunday night, and the Holy Spirit would get to moving. And before long, people were rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Before long, if there's anything was wrong, 
they made that right, and people just get happy in the Lord, rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I, I did th- have this thought, though I wasn't around to reflect upon it. Wouldn't it have been a lot better if the Holy Spirit had a, started moving, they had allowed him to start moving in the business meeting instead of just after the business meeting? And that's what we see in our text tonight. The Holy Spirit actually got to moving in a business meeting. But, you know, the thing to to pick up from that is you read through the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was always moving in their lives. They got together for prayer in their homes, and the Holy Spirit moved. They went out on the streets to preach, and the Holy Spirit moved. They gathered for communion, and the Holy Spirit moved. They got together in church, and the Holy Spirit spoke. I mean, he was always moving, but the thing is, he was so much a part of their lives, so prevalent among them, that the Holy Spirit even moved in a business meeting. Hallelujah. If he can move in a business meeting, he can move tonight in a worship service. Wouldn't you like the Holy Spirit to be that involved in our lives? Amen. Let me just share a little bit about this. And, and, and it's, a, it's a lengthy chapter, so I just want to summarize it. Not only did Jews get saved, but Gentiles started getting saved. Former idolaters and pagan worships, they start getting saved. Well, you know, when the Jews got saved, they're still Jews. And they got a lot of traditions and a lot of rules they follow. But, but uh, they're, they're saved, but they still follow them because they're Jews. Well, that was okay until some of the Jews looked over at the Gentiles that got saved and said, listen, you might have got saved, but if you want to keep your salvation, if you want to keep that what God has done in your heart, then you need to adopt all of our cultural rules and traditions and things. And it caused a big dissension. You can read about it in Galatians. Even Barnabas got caught up in it, and, and Peter was a little bit of a hypocrite on the situation and, 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 and all of that. And so finally, it was such an issue that the Gentiles sent Paul and Barnabas, they sent them to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders to see what they should do about this. Should the Gentiles accept all these extra rules from the Jews and all of this? And so they gathered in, in, in Jerusalem. And at this time, guess who's pastoring the church of Jerusalem? It's Jesus' half-brother, James, from whom we have an epistle in our Bible. And so you have these apostles there. You have these elders there. You've got James there. And they get in this discussion, and it got deep. It involved culture. It involved theology. It involved different races. And they're, they're, they're getting in this discussion. You know, one thing about it, Peter, he, he stood up. Finally, he got things straightened out there. And he stood up and said, before you make this decision, you've got to remember something. God sent me to the Gentiles and told me not to call them unclean and God saved them and filled with them with the Holy Spirit and and God got to move it in that place and pretty soon James said we've made a determination and he had him put it down in a letter to take to all the churches and it's in this determination of what they should do and basically I'm going to to tell you what they said I'm not going to use the terms but they said the Gentiles don't need to follow anything of the Jews cultural and customs except this one thing eating the blood and things sacrificed to idols that is so repulsive to the Jews that that would be an offense to them And, and so he was writing that and in that letter when he was giving the conclusion of that council that business meeting he said it seemed good to us and to the holy spirit that this is our conclusion and we should send this to you of what you ought to do so he's admitting that that was not just the determination of men he's admitting that somewhere in that business meeting the holy spirit got involved and the result was holy spirit driven holy spirit determined and so could i say one more time isn't it wonderful that the holy spirit showed up in a business meeting or let's make it a little more spiritual he showed up during a theological discussion and debate a cultural matter but if he was involved in that kind of stuff don't you think he wants to be involved in our everyday life i think he wants to be involved And I want to look at this tonight. There at at this business meeting, and for us, but he was involved as a person. As a person. You know, I was disturbed by something I read this week. And 
I hope you don't consider these things soapboxes, but I am really, really concerned about the route Christianity has taken in America. And that's why I'm preaching some of the things I'm preaching. I mean, that Christianity is, is becoming so shallow. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with how-to messages. But we've heard how-to messages, and, and we've heard all these other uh, faith messages and all this, to the point people don't even know their Bibles anymore. They don't know the cardinal spiritual truths. And in a recent survey, 51% of evangelicals said that they did not believe the Holy Spirit was a person and said they believed the Holy Spirit was a power or a force or an influence. 51% of evangelicals did not believe the Holy Spirit was a person. When I read my Bible, I have trouble with that. He is a triune God. He is a God, one being, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, you know, I heard this at youth camp, and I'm not faulting it at a bit because I understand what young people were doing. But uh, God was moving in such a tremendous way, and they were excited about it. And I heard one young kid ask another several times, one teenager, another, did you get it? Did you get it? Well, what? The Holy Ghost. Did you get it? Now, I understood what they're talking about is the experience, it experience the baptism the infilling get it that's what they're saying but i want you to know the holy spirit is not an it the holy spirit is he he is a person amen you know what makes a person what makes a person i mean we know this isn't a person because it doesn't have these things what makes a person is intellect right and emotion that's a part of it some People say you shouldn't have any emotion. We're people. We're going to have emotion. So intellect, emotion, and then a will, an ability to consciously make decisions. To be a person, you have intellect, you have emotion, and you have will. Amen. Let me show you this with the Holy Spirit. There's many verses. I'm just going to use one for each one. The Holy Spirit has intellect. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans 8, 27? And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a mind. Not only does the Holy Spirit have a mind and intellect, the Holy Spirit has emotions. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. You can't grieve a power. How many here can grieve electricity? You can't do it. Can you grieve the wind? You can't do it. You can't grieve a power or a force. You can only grieve the emotions of a person. And so the Holy Spirit, he has, he has intellect. He has emotions. And the Holy Spirit has a will. He chooses. Many scriptures, here's once, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. But all these, speaking of the gifts of the Spirit, worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. He chooses. Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has intellect, emotion, and will. And Jesus, when he spoke of the Holy Spirit, he used personal pronouns. He, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Amen. He said, when he comes, his name is going to be comforter. He will teach you. He will show the things of me to you. He will show you things to come. A power doesn't teach. A force doesn't teach. A person teaches. How many believes the Holy Spirit is a person? Now let me tell you, in that business meeting, and in our lives as well, he was involved then, he wants to be involved now as a person. What does a person do? They talk to you. They commune with you. They share how they feel about something. But also as a person, they can be offended. They can be grieved. Amen. They should be listened to. I, I feel strongly about this, and I have found myself praying. I, oh, Holy Spirit, 
forgive me if I grieve you in any way. Have you ever prayed that? He's a person. And I'm sorry, Holy Spirit. Have you ever left a church service recognizing he's a person? And say, I'm sorry, Holy Spirit. I didn't listen to you the way you were trying to talk to me tonight. I don't want, I mean, listen, friend. I mean, it ought to be something in our heart that we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. You can't offend power, but you can offend a person. I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to listen as he teaches. I want to follow his instruction. When he tries to show me something, I want to look. Have you ever tried to show somebody something and they wouldn't even look at it? Amen. That's offensive. And the Holy Spirit tries to show us something and we won't even look at it. He was involved as a person. Amen. I thought of this tonight and I think it's a it's a question well worth asking. But what if folks were as concerned about hurting the Holy Spirit's feelings as they were about getting their own feelings hurt? You know, you kind of get that sometimes. Well, they hurt my feelings or I got hurt or this and that. What if people were more concerned about hurting the Holy Spirit's feeling than having their feelings hurt? He is a person. And I'm telling you, he was involved in that business meeting because they recognized him as a person and gave him honor and respect that was due him. Can you say amen? Secondly, not only was he involved in that meeting and wants to be involved in our lives as a person, he was involved by his presence. Now, somebody can be a person, but unless they're in your proximity, you do not experience their person or their presence. And I want you to know, we've established that the Holy Spirit is a person, but it's another thing when he's in our proximity, then we experience his presence. Not only there at the Council of Jerusalem did they, would they admit the Holy Spirit is he a person, but they admitted he was there with them, with his presence. Amen. That you, now, if you'd been at the Council of Jerusalem, you could have seen Peter, you could have seen Paul, and you could have seen James and Barnabas and others of these, and you could not have seen the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not seen, but they could tell that he was there as certainly as, as if he had occupied a seat. Those people gathered there, they knew the Holy Spirit's presence was there. And I believe one of the reasons they knew that he was there is because they were looking for him to be there. Isn't that interesting? Looking for somebody you can't see. And I want you to know his invisibility did not take away from their awareness that his presence was amongst them. You can't see the Holy Spirit with your eyes tonight. Oh, but if you'd begin to worship, you'd begin to reach out to the Lord. You'd begin to have faith in your heart. You would recognize his presence is amongst us. How can you say that? Because we are his people. We are his temple. Amen. He is amongst his people. Oh, if there's anything we need, it's the presence of the Holy Ghost. Amen. His presence was in that meeting. He was inspiring them in the worst of situations. It looks like the church is about to split. It looks like there's going to be a racial, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Chasm amongst the people of God. And yet the Holy Spirit's presence there. And he's inspiring them. He's enabling them. I mean, they're dealing with theology. They're dealing with cultural matters. That thing could have blown up. It did not blow up because the Holy Spirit was there. I'm telling you, in the situations of our own life, there are situations that could be disastrous. There are situations that could be ruinous. Amen. To us and to our our families and to the church of God. But I'm telling you, if you'll let the Holy Spirit get involved, what could have been a horrible situation can be turned around by His presence. Have you ever had it happen? Have you ever had a horrible situation turned around by His presence? Amen. That's what happened at this meeting. Amen. His presence was there. Amen. The presence of the Holy Spirit is an evident thing that we can experience. We can experience his presence and could I tell you could I tell you amen come on to the altar amen. 
I was talking about over here. Amen. Could I tell you, not only can we experience his presence in the house of God, you can experience his presence in your home. You can experience his presence in the car on the way to work. You can experience his presence at a tough moment at work. You can experience his presence walking down the halls of a public school. That's the way he is. Why? He is a person, but he's also spirit. I as a person, I inhabit a body. I can only be at one place and not another, but the Holy Spirit is just that. He's a person who is spirit. He can be at your house and at my house. He can be at your place of work. He can be at your place of work. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad for the holy presence of the Holy Spirit? Amen. That's what we ought to desire. Not only was he involved as a person and involved by his presence, he was involved with his prompting. He prompted them. Again, our text, James said, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. It seemed, how did they know that, I ask you? How did they know it seemed good to the Holy Ghost? How did they know? Well, since we know a little bit about the Holy Spirit's moving from the Bible, we can surmise some things. The leaders, like James, they could have been aware of all of a sudden the thoughts they were having were not thoughts being generated by their own gray matter. If you've ever been used of God in any way, you recognize that moment that the thoughts that you're having, you did not generate them. It could have been that. James could have been saying the Holy Spirit got in that meeting and began to inspire us. It could have been a word of knowledge. Let me tell you something. Amen. We've got so we're afraid sometimes to, I'm not talking about here necessarily, but open it up for testimony service because people just tell any and everything. They'll get up and testify about their grocery list or something. Tell you what all was on their grocery list. But there was a time when the Holy Spirit would move upon somebody and they would stand and they would share supernaturally the very word of wisdom or knowledge that the congregation or somebody in the congregation needed at that strategic moment in their life. Nobody else knew. Nobody else knew the problem. Nobody else knew the solution. But the Holy Spirit shared that word of knowledge. It might have been a prophecy. Somebody might have stood up and given a prophecy. It might have been a message in tongues, an interpretation. Amen. It might have just been that being all of a sudden, all that were gathered there, they had a unity of mind and direction. You can't do that naturally. You can't get everybody on the same page. Have you ever been in a service when all of a sudden we're all thinking about the same thing. We're all experiencing the same thing. We don't know just how he did it, but the Holy Spirit got involved in there and prompted them in a certain direction, gave them guidance, made the way clear before them. He prompted them. Amen. The Holy Spirit did two things in that meeting. He'll do it tonight and he'll do it in your life. He imparted wisdom and gave unity. Again, I want to tell you, we don't realize how bad it was. If the Holy Spirit hadn't gotten involved in that thing, there could have been a split right there way back those 2,000 years ago. But the Holy Spirit gave them the wisdom and gave them unity. Oh, hallelujah. I said, How don't you want Him involved in your life? He can do that in the situations that you're facing tomorrow. He can impart wisdom. He did something else. He, he relieved tension. I, I, I mean, those, those folks could have come to blows. It was so heated. Have you noticed how quickly folks can get heated? If you don't, if you don't believe that, you guys just get together playing some basketball and there's a dispute comes up on what, what happened and whether the line was crossed or this and that. You'll find how quickly people can get heated. Amen. Watch that volleyball. Amen. You'll find how quickly people can get heated. I'm telling you, it can happen even on spiritual matters. I'm pre-trib and you're mid-trib and we're going to fight about it. Amen. I'm telling you, it could have been, oh, it could have been disastrous. Oh, but there was a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, to 
to be sensitive. You're going the wrong direction. He prompts you. You're thinking the wrong thing. He prompts you. You're feeling a way you shouldn't be feeling. And he prompts you. How many desires the prompting of the Holy Spirit? Being involved in the prompting of our lives. Amen. It seems good to the Holy Ghost. However he did it, he let them know. I heard some time back, I think it's great. I I love this kind of uh, wisdom. Amen. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost. One older preacher said, if it seems good to the Holy Ghost, it better seem good to us. Look right there. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. If it seems good to the Holy Ghost, it better seem good to us. Oh, don't you know we ought to want to be on the same page as the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Be in agreement. Have you thought about what the Holy Spirit thinks? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Before we made some decision, got involved in something. That we said, Holy Spirit, what do you think about this? What seems good to the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit think about it? Amen. Would the Holy Spirit think it's a good thing? If you let Him be involved, He'll let you know what He thinks. I said, if you'll let Him be involved, He'll let you know what He thinks. It seemeth good to the Holy Spirit. Amen. I mean, what's the Holy Spirit involved in your lives? Would you come, music? From as far back as I can remember in the context of the Holy Spirit's moving, whether it's conviction upon a sinner or prompting somebody to worship, I've heard this expression, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. How many's heard that expression? Yeah, it's real ironic to me that two individuals and in Far away states has no idea that this thing about the Holy Spirit has been on my heart. Totally unconnected, but two calls this week about the same verse in 1 Corinthians 14. I want to tell you, first of all, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, this is not something we work. It He works us. We've made it in so many circles. That somehow we harness the power and we work this thing about the gifts. We're in control. We do it. No, sir. He works us. And he is a gentleman. He will never insert himself into somebody's life if they're not willing for his involvement. If you don't want him involved in your life, he won't be involved. If you don't want the Holy Spirit involved in your worship, he will not insert himself. If you don't want the Holy Spirit involved in your decision making, he will not insert himself. How many believes what the preacher's telling you? He's a gentleman. Now, please understand, it's just an illustration, but I understand somewhat about this. Because I have the temperament and the nature. If I sense that people don't want me there. The last thing in the world I want to do is to be there. If I come into your house, over to your house, and I sense that you'd rather me not be there, I'm leaving as quick as I can. That's my nature. And I'm not claiming to be like the Holy Spirit, but I'm telling you, in illustration, the Holy Spirit is not there where folks don't want Him. But I want to tell you the other side of it is, if the Holy Spirit... If you want the Holy Spirit there, He will be there, even at a business meeting. (laughs) Oh, hallelujah. Even in the break room. Even between classes, walking that tunnel from the parking lot to the college class. He'll be involved if you want Him. I want Him involved in my life. I said, I want Him involved in my life. Could you stand across the building? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement of your word. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, we need you in our lives. We want to know what you think. We want to know how you feel. We want to know what you would do. Amen. I'm certainly not trying to tell you how to pray or give you 
a ritualistic prayer. But I wonder tonight, would you as the people of God come to this altar? If you could think about your life and your worship and maybe some decisions you're making, directions you're taking. I wonder if you could just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what seems good to you in my life? What, what, what a, it, this in my life, what seems good to you? And then remember, He's a person. Holy Spirit, what do you think about it? Holy Spirit, how do you feel about it? And Holy Spirit, what would you do in this situation? Amen. If it's your desire for the Holy Spirit to be involved in your life, would you fill these altars tonight and say, Holy Spirit, I want you involved in my life. Speaking, teaching, leading, comforting, convicting, empowering, inspiring. Hallelujah. 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 Inviting. He comes with invitation. Oh, I need your Holy Spirit. We honor you tonight. I've got to have you involved. I need you involved. don't doubt tonight. Just ask Him to be involved in your life. Ask Him if it seems good to Him. Holy Spirit. 